Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we'll be discussing My Bloody Valentine, which released on February 11th, 1981. It was written by John Beard, based on a story by Stephen A. Miller, directed by George Mahalka, and released by Paramount Pictures. The day before My Bloody Valentine was released, Stephanie Beatrice was born. I, I like her a lot. I don't know who that is. She's I, on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and oh, okay. she was in the Pee-wee movie. Oh, uh, okay. In a Pee-wee movie? The, the newer one. Oh, the newer one, okay. Yeah, the Netflix one. Gotcha. Producers Andre Link and John Dunning attribute the film's origin to a conversation about which holidays hadn't already been adapted into slasher films in the wake of the successes of <laughs> Halloween and Friday the 13th. <laughs> and Black I feel Christmas. like that conversation continues today. Yeah, that happens yeah. every day between every group of friends. Groundhog Day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's definitely horror versions of that. You have Happy Death Day now. You have... Mm -hmm. uh, there's another one, I think. Happy Death Day to Me, which is what they called the second movie. Director Mahalka was approached, based on the strength of his previous film, Pickup Summer, a.k.a. Pinball Summer, when Mahalka was interested in the story pitched by Stephen Miller, John Beard was brought on to write a script. Worried that someone might beat them to the punch, the working title of the film was The Secret, to throw people off of their brilliant idea for a movie. But instead... Everything they thought just came true. But they always plan to release it as My Bloody Valentine from the beginning. Maybe it's too on the nose, but I think Be Mine might have been a better title, mm -hmm. since Valentine's Day has nothing to do with mines. <laughs> the production took place in Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia, chosen for its rustic atmosphere, but upon being chosen, the locals spent $50,000 to have the mine painted and cleaned. What? Director Mahalka has claimed that up to $75,000 of the budget was spent trying to return the mines to their original state. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so cute. They said it looked like a theme park down there. When they, when they were like, what did you do? I've seen different points of trivia claim that the filming took place between 820 and 900 feet underground. Either way is crazy. Yeah. It took an hour to get everybody down into the mines oh before they gosh. could shoot oh, stuff. Is that brings up an interesting trivia question. What's the What's deepest movie ever filmed? That's something Chris Nolan, right? Probably. Are you talking about psychologically oh. deep? <laughs> <laughs> I, I meant, I'm sorry. I meant physically deep on land. <laughs> not like, not like the footage that James Cameron obtained of Titanic. Like, well, but, right. Like the, the abyss was <laughs> yeah, filmed on location. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the abyss was actually filmed in like this cooling tower. It was really awesome. I think uh, the core holds that record. Because <laughs> you can't get any. <laughs> the only way out Journey is in. Journey to the center of the earth. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, so many joke options. Because, uh, yeah, filming a film at 900 feet deep is pretty crazy. Yeah, I don't think that's the usual strategy. Like, even for the remake, they just shot it, like, on a shitty soundstage. They didn't, they didn't bother to go into an actual mine for it. But they had to use special lighting because of the real danger of methane explosions. Yeah. So it's very dangerous to even be down there, let alone shoot things. The version of the film that we watched is the uncut version. Having been released in the immediate aftermath of John Lennon's assassination, the studio decided to cut nine minutes worth of the most gratuitous violence. And by the time it hit theaters, almost every interesting kill happened off camera. It wasn't until the film was acquired by Lionsgate in 2009 that the original cut was restored. Unfortunately, footage from one of the kills in the film was never recovered and is still left out of the edit, but we'll cover that when we get to it. The identity of the film's killer was kept a secret, even from the cast, including the killer him or herself, because the filmmakers liked the idea of the mystery being real among the actors. So the guy who is the killer was also not told he was the killer? Yeah, not until it was obvious from the scenes that they had shot, but he didn't know up until that point when they were setting up that scene. But... 
I mean, isn't that important to know as an actor? Like that. Not if they don't want you to give it away. Right. I, well, I get, I get that you don't want to give it away, but like, I, I don't know, just in, in your, in your acting, like, like you should know that you're actually a killer unless it's like a split personality thing and you just don't know what the other personality is doing. Yeah, that's true. Well, there was a lot of that in the eighties. In 2001, director George Mahalka approached Paramount with a sequel pitch but was turned away. I think it was called like Return of the Minor or something like that. So maybe that was fine. Maybe that's fine that that got shut down. But in 2009, Lionsgate acquired the rights and released that restored cut that I mentioned. And they did that specifically to draw up publicity for their upcoming reboot of the franchise. But honestly, don't bother with it. It's The plot is a mess and it's shot like a soap opera for some reason. Uh, it's it's not good and all the kills are cg and bad cg i have found conflicting reports that the pop band of the same name my bloody valentine either took it from this film or that they had never heard of this film before choosing the name so you the listener get to decide (laughs) we start with the paramount logo which means this is coming from the same studio as friday the 13th last year and this deserved at least 10 sequels including one in a space mine (laughs) <laughs> we cut to a Dutch angle shot looking down a mine shaft as two miners in full outfits with masks approach camera. The two stop near a hanging light in the mine and one approaches the camera as the other begins to disrobe behind him. The undressing miner is a woman, hopefully not an actual miner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 my note is a pair of miners and I go, oh, sexy miners. <laughs> yeah, it's okay if they're both miners. <laughs> my next note is <laughs> that's not the only shaft she'll be seeing tonight <laughs> oh no richard <laughs> the undressing miner is a woman wearing just a bra under the uniform the costumed miner swings a pickaxe into the wall beside her we now see a small heart tattoo over her left breast and she takes off her mask to swish her hair around cinematically <laughs> she starts to unzip the other miner's clothes And when she tries to remove his mask, he stops her. This actress doesn't have a lot of credits, but we had her last year as a car hop in Hollywood Nights. Bizarrely, she starts stroking the flaccid tube hanging down from his mask. (laughs) Uh, He starts to palm one of her boobs briefly and then shoves her backward onto the pickaxe that he stabbed into the wall. And it stabs completely through her chest and out the front. The effect here is incredible with the skin stretching and eventually bursting from the blade poking through it looks really great i love this effect and actually all the effects as we move forward are really terrific practical effects in here the woman begins to scream and the camera floats directly into her screaming mouth and we get our title card my bloody valentine with a copyright below that reads 1981 secret film which is again a reference to the working title We cut to Thursday, February 12th, 1809. Not totally clear where we started, but it's now Thursday, February 12th. A slow moving line of mine carts carries a whole team of miners out of the mine for the night. Turns out they left all the apprentices down below to find their way out on foot because they're noobs. They say later though, that it's like three miles. I'm like, you just made this, these people are gonna walk for like an hour to get out of this mine. (laughs) They joke around about the inevitable methane explosion that will destroy this mine someday. The men all file into the showers and start picking on one guy for having a huge dick. And then they pick on another guy because he left town for a while. And when he came back, his girlfriend was dating someone else. Bet you wish you never came back now that your girlfriend's going out with Axel. TJ is clearly upset about it. And everyone else shuts up in the awkwardness that follows until they break it up with a beer run. Last one into town gets the brew. The boys all race half naked to their cars so they won't have to pay for alcohol. They all pile into their vehicles, including one Volkswagen bug converted into a pickup truck that looks pretty badass. (laughs) They race past a billboard for Valentine Bluffs, the name of this town with an impressive neon sign. The guys burst into the union hall where their girlfriends are decorating for an upcoming Valentine's dance. I guess we dropped the whole buying alcohol thing. Yeah. So I wasn't sure, like what the age of this group is supposed to be. I get that they're not high school because they wouldn't be working in the mines. Right. Uh, but it, they're obviously not miners, but they obviously are miners. Yeah. <laughs> How many times are we going to make this joke today? Over and over. <laughs> yeah. 
until it no, stops. No, I think they're young funny. adults. Yeah, yeah, I, I put them in their their early twenties. Yeah, but it is interesting because usually these slasher movies they just they're Teens. teenagers yeah. and there's no reason to go any further than that. But they need to be able to buy alcohol. So the guys burst into the union hall where their girlfriends are decorating for an upcoming Valentine's dance. Howard, the goof of the bunch, blasts an air horn to freak everybody out. All the boys and girls pair off. Gretchen starts avoiding Howard immediately before he can ask her to the dance. Hollis goes to kiss his girlfriend, Patty. This is my favorite couple. Hollis is a heftier guy with a handlebar mustache, and his girlfriend is completely adorable and way out of his league, but by the end, these are just the two best people in the whole film. Axel and TJ's ex, Sarah, kiss through a ladder, and TJ looks uncomfortable about it. And then the last guy lifts his girlfriend off the ground by her skull to kiss her. Like, he just grabs her head on both sides and picks her up like two feet off the ground. We cut outside where Mayor Hanniger is complimenting a woman named Mabel for all the work she's done putting this dance together. She mentions that she thought the first dance in 20 years should be special, and Hanniger isn't excited about the comment. Uh, yeah, well, uh, of course you're right, Mabel, but I think we'd all be better off if you played down the fact that it's the first Valentine's dance in 20 years, if you know what I mean. I actually liked how efficient the writing was there, that nobody had to mention a tragedy. We just get it, that we're not yeah. going to talk about it because it will upset people. Yeah. As Mabel and the mayor approach the union hall, Howard comes stumbling out the door with a massive head wound, and he knocks Mabel down the stairs. <laughs> Turns out it was just a prank, bro. They painted his head to look like a brain injury. And the mayor is not amused. You're supposed to be decorating the room, not each other. TJ tries to sneak out of the hall, and when the mayor asks where he's headed, he says he's going for a beer and a good nose pick. For whatever reason, Axel delivers his next line directly into camera as though we're getting the mayor's POV. He says that TJ hates working in the mines, and the mayor gives us some vague exposition for TJ. Yeah, he left town for a while. Whatever he left to do didn't work out. He's back now. <laughs> and oh yeah, he's my son. <laughs> and together we own the mines. <laughs> so I'm the mayor who owns the mine and my son left to do a thing, but right. we're never going to say what. Right. And he's like, if he's here, he's going to be working in the mines. So mm -hmm. he's his dad's forcing him to work there. Yeah. Chief Newbie wanders in for a bit and doesn't really contribute to the scene beside waving around his seemingly empty pipe. Mabel and Newbie share a flirtatious glance, and she says that she better head out too. She has to rewash all of the shit that Howard splashed fake blood on. Howard suddenly remembers a package left for the mayor in a heart-shaped box and runs out to give it to him in the parking lot. He looks around at Mabel and Newbie, but everyone denies having left it for him. As Chief Newbie drives the mayor down the road, the mayor opens this box, and he starts to read the attached card on the box, before opening it to find a human heart. He takes it like a champ, though. From the heart comes a warning filled with bloody good cheer. Remember what happened as the 14th draws near. It can't be happening. It can't be happening. I'd have just been vomiting all over the cab of this truck as soon as I saw a human heart in a box. Chief Newbie puts on the sirens and spins the car around, and suddenly a dog is making a run for their car and gets way too close for my comfort. Yeah, that freaked me out. We cut to The Cage, which is Valentine Bluff's dive bar, where Hollis and Axel are playing Mumbledy Peg. Hap, a drunk at the bar and the film's harbinger, slurs his rhyming prophecies of doom. It's a bad time, this time of year. There's bad things coming. My words you hear. Beware the 14th if you value your life. Here we go again. How many times is he going to tell us? Oh, let him tell it. TJ's heard enough and wanders away from him. Some of the kids just laugh off Hap's warnings, but he calls them fools for not taking it seriously, just as Axel slices open his finger. Wait, is, is he just a drunk? I thought he was the bartender. I think he's a both. He okay. seems drunk, but he's, <laughs> he's behind the bar, yes. Hap launches into the story of 20 years ago at the last Valentine's dance. Everybody in town was there. Hap claims that the Valentine's Day dance was a century-old tradition here, but assuming that 20 years ago was 1960 and 100 years before that was 1860, Nova Scotia wasn't even founded yet, let alone the mining town of Valentine Bluff. 
So I don't think that it was a hundred year tradition of the town. The only people who weren't there were the seven miners that were working in the mines, two supervisors, and five down below. The soups got tired of waiting and didn't check the methane levels on their way out and ditched the rest of the team. The consequent explosion trapped the last five underground and teams dug for six weeks around the clock to reach them. When they got there, they found one man alive, Harry Warden, munching on a human arm. <sighs> It reminds me of the sequence that uh, that Eli Roth's cameo talks about in uh, Cabin Fever. Like how it's like silly photography. Like it's almost played like a joke when he's holding yeah. his arm and he's like chewing on it and screaming laughing. I just like six weeks seems like a really long time. Yeah. To, to have enough, even if you're eating other people that were there with you, like that, that, dead flesh is not going to stay good that long and you have to have enough air and water clean water to go through that place like it just does just doesn't seem super realistic i also wonder how long he waited before he killed and started eating these people like he could probably survive like a week and a half without eating yeah and then maybe the first guy dies then and then everybody splits that guy up but maybe warden just kills all these guys or he keeps some of them yeah, alive specifically that- to kill later <laughs> I guess that's true. I guess he could have been strategically rationing when he killed yeah. them and ate them. I didn't think about that. <laughs> they were they were drawing straws. Harry Warden spent the next year in a state mental hospital. Exactly one year later, on Valentine's Day, he came back to town. He killed the two supervisors who had left their posts the year before. Then he cut out their hearts and stuffed them into heart-shaped candy boxes. Now, why was he let out of the state mental hospital? <laughs> Like, why were they like, all right, it's been a year. You go have your fun. I don't know that he was let out. I mean. He we, probably just escaped. He might have escaped. But also we come to realize that this place doesn't really keep good track of their That's people true. anyways. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, uh, I mean, I, you know, after a year, uh, unless he was being convicted of a crime, I mean, obviously, like, these were extenuating circumstances. So you really, sure. you know. I guess you you could argue like, oh, I couldn't blame him. He did what he had to do to survive, and yeah. it's possible this after a year he was like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm over it now, and That's they let true. him go. There's no evidence that he actually murdered the people in there. Right, he just ate them. He was just unwell it was, when they found him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was just unwell for being stuck alone, you know, in a in a cave for six weeks. Yeah, people would have a tough time with that. They found a note with the hearts warning them against ever holding another Valentine's Day dance. Weirdly, though, Hap says that Harry Warden comes back to town every Valentine's to make certain that his rule is followed. But the prevailing knowledge of the town seems to be that Warden was institutionalized after this and presumably not released every year to check on (laughs) Valentine Bluff. Weirder still, Warden waits in the Henniger mine for someone to kill. So he's punishing other miners, not dance goers. We cut back to the bar as Hap finishes his warning. Forget about having a party at all on Saturday night. You may not live to see daylight. (laughs) Well, I mean, I think that part of the concept of the revenge, though, is to to get back at the guys that abandoned him, in theory. Right. But if he's actually underground in the mines, then he's he's not killing supervisors. He's killing the people working in the mines. Yeah, I'm just saying that that everybody abandoned him to go to Oh, the I guess dance. sure. It's not sure. just ju- not just supervisors. But the only people who didn't abandon him were the other people that were down in the mine with him. I guess that's fair. Howard pops up to make a fart noise right at the end of Hap's warning and everybody cracks up about it. A waitress named Harriet brings a couple moose heads to the table and suddenly all the guys are roasting her in a song. Moose heads, by the way, uh, a delicacy in Canada before you start making fun of these people for eating entire moose heads. No, uh, it's it's a kind of about? it's a kind of beer <laughs> called Mooseheads. Did you not notice the Moosehead in this? Because literally every beer that anyone drinks is a Moosehead, and there's just giant Moosehead billboards all over the bar. Just not paying that close attention. Oh, there is a young fire named Harriet who has never been robbed of her chariot. Oh, try as she may, this girl can get. Virgin 
Sarah tries to stand from the table and Axel demands to know where she's going. She lies that she just needs to head to the jukebox so that she can chat up her ex, TJ. She blames him for fucking things up between them and he leaves. In the morgue, the coroner tells them that the heart that they found or that they were gifted belongs to a young woman about 30 years old. I don't know if you can determine the sex of a heart. Um, um, well, I, I mean, I think you can with DNA, but I don't know that you can from just looking at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think they were. They did a DNA test in 1980 on this heart and determined that this is a woman's heart. I think it's just so that we, the audience, know that lady who got stabbed through her tattoo, That's this is her heart. Yeah. Which means that was recent. He asks well, what's going well, on. Well, girls' hearts of- are pink and guys' hearts are blue. So. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, there might be a minor size difference. That minor be- size difference. <laughs> 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 All right, move on. <laughs> <laughs> he asks what's going on out in Valentine Bluff, and Newbie asks if he remembers Harry Warden. God, of course I remember. Those were terrible murders. God, I thought they locked him up in Eastfield 20 years ago. The coroner agrees that Harry Warden must be back in town. We see someone in boots tiptoe around Madame Mabel's laundrette, spying on Mabel as she decorates inside. She's also loading a bunch of heart-shaped plushies into a washing machine. In POV, the voyeur pushes into the laundromat and leaves a valentine where Mabel will find it on the table before hiding around a corner. She reads the card out loud. Roses are red, violets are blue. One is dead, and so are you? The tense bothers me here. Maybe one has died and you will too? But if (laughs) one is dead and I am too, then two are dead, no? (laughs) If they're both present tense? The person in costume chases her around the room in a full miner's outfit and then corners her against the back wall. He or she stabs her repeatedly with a pickaxe and we cut to a junkyard maybe? Uh, The guys are cooking meals on a radiator or something in an open car hood, and we get this POV wandering around the junkyard looking at them through piles of cars. TJ and Axel jump into a dueling harmonica moment. It seems friendly, but the interaction quickly devolves into a fight over Sarah. TJ insists that she's still in love with him, and Axel says that he blew his chance with her. After they separate, Hollis, the big guy, tells TJ to give Axel a break and TJ admits that the situation is not Axel's fault and that he even likes the guy. We cut to Chief Newby's office where he's on the phone with Eastfield, checking on the status of Harry Warden, and the woman running the place is infuriating. She's looking at her records of inmates and she says that he's not there. There's no record of this inmate having been at our facility. How can that be? He was committed by court order. I'm sorry, I have no records on him. Look, in 20 years, any number of things could have happened. Now, if this Harry Warden was committed, as you say, then he's simply no longer here. And if I have no records on him, I have to assume that he's transferred, he's released, or he's on the slab. One of three, take your pick. One out of three! She tells Chief Newby that he's not there now, so he either transferred, or he was released, or he died. But she's very blasé about this inmate that she lost. Spoiler alert, she's also just blatantly wrong and fucked up in her paperwork because there's a clear record of what happened to this guy. She, she's not wrong. She said that the, the records aren't here because he either was transferred, he left, or he died. And she said that the, they'd have to pull the other official records from the microfilm. Right. And, that, and that's what she was doing uh, yeah. in the time that it's that elapses. But it seemed like she didn't even want to do that. Well, it, no, I don't didn't. think it's... I don't think it's unreasonable to be like, hey, when somebody is one of these three things, if they die, transfer, or uh, get released. Put a letter at the bottom of their file. No, I'm just saying, put you put the file in deep storage. You know, it's just like, I, it's not something I need every day. I feel like this guy, I mean, I don't know how big the facility is either. It could be a bigger town or something like that. But if Charles Manson died at my hospital, I would remember the day it happened. I wouldn't forget, like, spoiler alert, he's dead. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> uh, but I feel like in her situation, I would remember this guy being there if he was the famous Valentine Bluff murderer. Yeah. Um, but this woman has no recollection of him ever having been there. And well, that place is full of murderers. I mean, 
Take your pick. Yeah, that's true. Maybe maybe she's got a whole collection going. But she seems hesitant to bother checking the microfilms at Central, but the chief is like, just do it. Look, look it up and get back to me as quickly as you can. It's important. The mayor suggests canceling the dance to be safe, and we cut to Sarah and Patty walking together discussing Sarah's love triangle. I was already crushing hard on this Patty girl, but the outfit she has on here is just a thousand percent adorable she's got it's a navy blue petticoat over a sort of goldenrod sweater vest and her knit scarf has the yellow from the vest but it matches her knit cap and then as they pop into the grocery store she takes off the cap and we see that her hair clips have the same yellow (laughs) it's too cute before they move inside she urges sarah to please choose someone to take to the dance because she wants to show off the dress she picked out. Cut down to here, slid up to there. I may not get out alive. <laughs> we cut to Chief Newby arriving at Mabel's laundromat. As he moves through the room, we see only two machines are running and one has a big bloody mess in it. It's very obvious from every angle that we see, <laughs> but Chief Newby has not noticed this yet. He finally starts opening machines and he notices, first he notices an upside down heart decoration which apparently Warden did 20 years ago when he killed people. He flipped the heart decorations upside down. Do they say down. that? They show him do it and smear blood on the oh, wall. Oh, okay, because yeah. I was like, they keep noticing this, but I don't remember them mentioning it. Yeah. Um, but first, Newby opens a dryer full of clean clothes, and as he's rifling through those for no reason, Mabel's roasted body impatiently tumbles out of the next dryer <laughs> over. <laughs> well, he's also like, noticing Over here. <laughs> yeah, he keeps he's, smelling it. Yeah, he yeah, checks he, his pipe. Like, is this is this from the bodies I was smoking earlier? Who's who's cooking steaks? <laughs> steaks, but, uh, steaks and hair. <laughs> oh god, my favorite. But yeah, her body tumbles out of this dryer, and she's all her eyes are all fogged over, and her skin is blistered and roasting, and the machine just keeps twisting her body over and over again. And we cut back to the mines. Axel starts giving TJ orders, and when he ignores them, a fight nearly breaks out. Back at the laundromat, Newby is talking the mayor out of telling anyone that there's a serial killer loose in their town. He tells the other cops on the scene, too, that everyone must lie that Mabel had a heart attack or the town will go into a panic. Hopefully Mabel doesn't have any family or anything that might be expecting an open casket when they hear about her heart attack. Yeah, well, it, there's a couple of things that bother me, too. She was left a box, a heart-shaped box, and and the M.O. of this killer is to leave a heart shaped box with a heart in it. So yeah. So was there a heart in that box? And if so, yeah, they never opened it? it. If there was, maybe the heart the heart box was to put hers in after oh, they okay. killed her. Maybe there you go. It, um, actually, he d- that we do see another box with a heart. So I'm wondering if if it's the same. I think box. that's I'd have, to, I'd have to double, ch- but I have to double check that if it's the same box. Oh, maybe I don't know. Yeah, it's not uh, clear. But, the chief then uh, warns the ambulance drivers that they better not let anyone see Mabel or they'll have to answer to him. It's like, yeah, w- would they? They're not. No, they're we're different. ambulance drivers. <laughs> yeah, it's like they don't they don't answer to the police. But also, how am I going to prevent anyone from seeing this body? I mean, like, I get that he's the, I think they're trying to set him up a little bit as like a red herring with with this kind of line. But oh, I didn't even consider that. But maybe. I, oh, I thought they were. But He's covering his own tracks. I don't really understand why he goes to all these measures to keep everything super secret from the town. Yeah. Even from other police officers. Yeah. Yeah. That's the craziest part of it. The cops are about to carry Mabel's body out when Newby stops them to check the cavity in her chest where her heart should be. And he finds another Valentine. It happened once. It happened twice. Cancel a dancer, it'll happen thrice. As soon as he got halfway through this letter, I was hoping that the killer would rhyme (laughs) twice with thrice because it's such a dumb rhyme. (laughs) This is the last straw for the mayor who cancels the dance on the spot. The kids are disappointed to find the union hall all locked up and they're claiming that it's canceled in Mabel's memory, even though obviously she would want this dance to go on. She was working on it all week. TJ drives straight from the mine after work to the store where Sarah works, I think. Like, it's Mm -hmm. the same store that we saw her go into with Patty, and he drags her out of the store and stuffs her into his car over her protestations. They drive out to a lakeside field where apparently they fucked once. Remember this spot? Of course I remember this spot. 
She tells him how hard it was for her when he disappeared without explanation. He apologizes and tells her how badly he fucked up by leaving. He begs her for a second chance, and she starts calling him Jesse here, which I'm guessing <laughs> is what the J in TJ stands for. And, and he says he's sorry. Yes, I'm so he apologizes. Damn sorry. <laughs> he apologizes as Canadianly as he can. I'm sorry. I'm so damn sorry. And she seems to accept this, and they kiss. That night we see Sarah walking down a sidewalk as a POV follows her, and she crashes right into Chief Newby. Uh, as they part ways, she walks toward the front door of her tiny house. <laughs> well, see, um, so it, it was at this point that I started really thinking about what the dynamic of this town was. Yeah. If it exists purely as a coal mining town. Well, these like, these are not real houses for living spaces. These are houses that were repurposed by the film, but they're usually where miners would live on site while they were working the mine. Okay, um, but, but they're oh, pretending that it's a residential neighborhood and that she lives in this 50 square foot house. But, but see, I, I, I felt the other way. I felt like that this was some kind of mining town structure and, and that these were People all just like, make do. Yeah. Well that, that these were like, not, I don't want to say like army wives kind of thing, like where they, they live on the base and these are the minor, girlfriends who who live in there and that's why they always have to go to the same bar the same town hall like i wasn't sure if this was part of a larger population because we don't see any other people that's true the main characters there's no extras in this movie except for maybe a couple of people in the bar but i think there's extras in the in the uh the rec room scene that are just more partiers but they, they all presumably just live in these other tiny homes yeah, there, there's no one driving on the streets ever. Yeah. They're just, they, they started the tiny home movement. Yeah, so I, I, I wasn't sure what was going on in this town. Uh, and this whole thing, uh, like one of these, uh, again, fake scares of, oh, it's just you, Chief Newbie. Yeah. Uh, like acting strange, wandering around in the middle of the night with his flashlight. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm just on my patrol. It's like, Really? You you just patrol on foot in random locations? (laughs) And we will see the killer multiple times over the course of the movie shine flashlights in people's faces. Yeah. Which feels like that's what's happening here. Back at the bar, Hap tells the kids that Mabel's heart attack story is a cover-up, and she for sure doesn't have a heart because she was killed and it was taken out of her body. The kids lament the canceled dance, and TJ suggests that they have a Valentine's party in his father's mind. Everybody (laughs) loves the idea. Everybody except for Hap, who I was kind of hoping was the killer all along, but the Harbinger is almost never the killer. It's like, I I love the mindset too. It's like, they're in a bar. It's like, if only we could do something and have a place to listen to music and drink alcohol. Hey, let's go to the mine. It's like, (laughs) like, you're already at the bar. You don't have to go anywhere. (laughs) There's there's already a pool table and drinking and music. Just stay here. Yeah. Forget about having a party at all tomorrow night. Or you'll be sorry. After the kids pile out of the bar, Hap closes up shop and breaks into the mine compound to set up a dummy with a pickaxe to scare the kids away. It's strung up in the doorway so that if they open the door, the dummy will raise a pickaxe at them. And he's so excited at his work that he tests it over and over. But on the (laughs) twelfth try, (laughs) the dummy is gone and a killer is standing there. I love it. He's so impressed with his work. He keeps yeah. laughing like hysterically, like a baby. Like you keep doing the same peekaboo move too. <laughs> and, he, and he's going to walk away, but he's like, no, I have to do it one, one more, more time. time. encore and he goes to open the door and there's a killer standing there who drives the pickaxe up through hap's jaw and then the tip of it comes out of hap's left eye pushing the eyeball out of the socket so that it's just dangling in front of his face this looks so great too this is really wonderful makeup work Um, he drags hap along the floor with his pickaxe and closes up that door again 
And then we cut to Saturday, February 14th, Valentine's Day. I'm assuming the reason we labeled today and the day before yesterday was to not draw attention to all the murders that happened on this film's Friday the 13th. (laughs) Coincidentally, we will review a parody film called Saturday the 14th later this year. Uh, Okay, and so, I mean, I have so many questions about these killings. Yeah. Uh, Is to, like... Why kill the one guy who's like on your side? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that does seem weird. Uh, he's, he's been, the one he's been trying... telling people to not have the party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you just killed the one guy who's trying to prevent all these things that you're prevent trying. That this is you what you want. Yeah, the night of the fourteenth, all the kids pile into the rec room above ground near the mines. At the police station, Chief Newby gets a heart-shaped box valentine, and because literally only him and the mayor are aware of the gruesome murders, he tells the other cop to leave the room before he opens it. Is it really necessary to keep the secret from other cops in this (laughs) small town who should be investigating it with you? I guess you don't want to start a panic in the police station. (laughs) Turns out, these are real chocolates, but the first tip was that they were shrink-wrapped, because all the other ones are just blood-wrapped. It's a gift from Mabel. It arrived late, I guess. Back in the rec room, one of the guys, Dave, gets hungry and wanders into the kitchen looking for food. He finds a handful of boiling hot dogs, and as he (laughs) bends over to inspect them, the killer dunks his head in the boiling water until he drowns in it. That's probably the worst way to die I've heard in a while. Yeah. Yeah, hot dog water is the worst. (laughs) Not the hot dog specific. That's the saving grace. That's the silver lining, Richard. (laughs) (laughs) I think drowning in boiling water is what makes it awful. The I hot mean, dogs are just like a condolence. This well, the shot is really cool though because you're the camera is like inside the pot looking right. up through the water at his face and his skin is like boiling off. Yeah. And your hot dogs keep drifting by. Well, yeah, again. <laughs> we can't make it too awful. Uh but what's like again, like I I have to question, I always question like what people's logic about doing things are. Because a woman had just come out of there with a hand with a hot dog. And so yeah. presumably there's some kind of like food available in the kitchen and readily available. So when he goes in there and it's pitch black. You don't think she just fished it out of the thing? I'm sure she just took it out of the pot. Well, I'm sure she did too. But I'm sure she didn't do it in the dark. Because <laughs> he goes into the room and it's pitch black. I'd be like oh, is this not where the food is? Because he acts like he's looking for for anything, but it's clearly like there's food on hand. I think he's what- pulling a toucan Sam and he's just following his nose. <laughs> <laughs> but then his nose falls off. He gets drowned in this boiling water. And then back at the police station, Newby hears wild dogs going nuts outside and he finds them gnawing on another bloody heart box. These are legit feral dogs and nasty ones too. Don Franks, the actor playing newbie here, must be a certified badass because he's not even flinching when these dogs are snapping at his hands. Yeah, but like, the, I, yeah, it's crazy. Are, are they trained? Like, no, they're wild dogs. They're wild dogs. Yeah. Like, was there movie trivia about these being wild dogs? Yes. Because, okay. Why were there wild dogs on set? I don't know. It's, it's a risk to the actor for sure. Yes. But they were in the neighborhood. And so they were like, oh, if we put some ketchup on this box, the dogs will sniff around it. And That's so dangerous. Yeah, it's fucking crazy. <laughs> the dogs like legit jump at this dude. But he reads the card on this bloody box and it says, you didn't stop the party. That's the whole message. It doesn't rhyme. Yeah. It just says, you didn't stop the party. What are you doing? <laughs> Do you remember the last time we had a murderer send us messages that didn't rhyme? Yes, those were terrible. (laughs) Those were terrible riddles. I'm assuming this is Hap's heart, but it could just as easily be Mabel's. Uh, Back in the rec room, Axel is aggressively pressuring Sarah to dance with him, and she's clearly not into it. TJ comes to her defense, sort of, but he's also basically just laying claim to her, and she's fed up with both of them and leaves. Finally, TJ and Axel start throwing punches, and about here is where I realized how badass Hollis is, because he immediately just has both guys in a headlock. He's like, fuck you guys, stop. Um, I'm pretty sure that while he's swinging Axel around here, he actually cracks his head on one of these hanging lamps in the room, and it does not look on purpose. It looks like he hits his head really hard on one of these swinging lamps. Howard tries to lighten the mood by snorting his beverage. 
Like, he does this multiple times in the scene where he's just like, look, I put a straw in my nose and I snorted a drink. I'm dumb. We cut inside the mine where a couple, John and Sylvia, are about to have sex on hard benches when she interrupts them to order drinks. She asks how they get their uniforms down from the ceiling and he invites her to pull a cable. John heads inside to grab a six pack from the fridge in the rec room and just as he passes the hot dog pot, a girl stirring the hot dogs around finds a boiled human heart and her scream distracts John from noticing that the rest of Dave's body is propped up in the fridge. He just reaches blindly toward a six pack and pulls it out without looking. While Sylvia waits for John to come back, she starts hearing water pipes get turned on and it's freaking her out. She thinks John's playing a prank on her. As she tries to escape the room, mining outfits are just dropping from the ceiling all around her. I really don't understand this mining outfit storage system and it Were really bothers me. you just hang it up me. in the ceiling? Well, because A, it just seems really weird to like just drape your clothes from a, hooks on the ceiling somehow. But B, yeah. like... I actually don't even understand the pulley system that they're using because there aren't ropes. There aren't strings hanging there down. There aren't strings hanging down. So they, they look like continuous loops, but it's not like a, you know, like a... Like blinds. Like blinds where you would just, you know, cycle through the loop so that it descends. Like, it's just they tug on it and it, and it falls, falls down. Yeah. I'm like, how does this system work? <laughs> well, knows? also, they never seem to wear them. When they're down on the mine, they never, they're not wearing those uniforms. Aren't they? No, they're just wearing kind of like plain clothes. I thought they stripped them off and then showered right at the beginning of the film. When they're first coming out of the mine? Yeah. They're they're wearing they're wearing mining clothes, but they're not wearing these rubber suits. Interesting. Maybe it's for a specific part of the mine or something. Eventually, as all these suits are falling down around her, Hap's corpse comes down on one of these same hooks, and his eyeball is still hanging out of his... I don't know why it wouldn't be anymore. Of course it's still hanging out of his head. And uh, and she just starts screaming into it, and she turns just in time to find the killer in the full miner outfit, who lifts her by her head and walks her across the room to one of the pinched-off water spouts and just impales the back of her head on it. He cranks the water on, And when John returns, he finds Sylvia hanging there with water blasting out of her mouth the way we wanted it to work in To All A Good Night last year. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. The effects here honestly hold up pretty great. Um, What they do is they, the camera shows up to like her top lip because it's a prosthetic head, but the mouth looks good and the water is just blasting out of her mouth. And then we get the sort of um, over the shoulder shot where you just see like out of focus the face with the water blowing out of the mouth and it it looks really cool we cut to chief newbie's car where he was just about to get to the mine and a call comes through from the station apparently eastfield has an urgent message so he pulls a yui and heads back to the station i would just say ask them what the message is and radio it to me (laughs) yeah or patch them through yeah All the couples simultaneously remember that the whole point of coming to this rec room was to go down into the mine, so they grab a bunch of beer and head on in, but TJ tries to stop them, even though this whole thing was his suggestion, and he reminds them of the most important rule. Where do you think you're going? We're just going to go for a quick ride and come right back up, believe me. You can't take them down there. You know the rule. No women in the mine. (laughs) Hollis assures him that they'll be right back. He's a great tour guide. He's collecting blankets and flashlights from the control room, and he starts taking them down into the mines. There are six people in this mine group. We have Hollis and Patty, his girlfriend. We have Sarah, uh, who's just trying to get away from her two exes. Harriet, the alleged virgin waitress. Mike and Howard, who are just two extra guys. Uh, Mike and Harriet are bringing up the rear, and they decide that they're going to hang back and have a little fun. A girl, Gretchen maybe? comes screaming out of the rec room kitchen where apparently they finally found Dave's body. At the same time as that happens, John bursts through the other door freaking out about Sylvia being impaled on a shower head and Axel makes a split second determination. Somebody's ah! going It's Harry Warden! He's here! Everybody get the fuck out! Go! 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 TJ tells Axel that Sarah is in the mines and they head down together. Hollis leads Patty and Sarah through a low ceiling section of cave when suddenly Howard comes swinging down from above. But it's just another prank, bro. <laughs> yeah, I haven't worked down here in years. Not since Harry Warden. <laughs> <laughs> Holy 
Stop! <laughs> what do you think you're trying to do, you jerk? Easy, I got a hangover. <laughs> the four remaining people decide to look for Mike and Harriet, and we see a POV watching them down here. We cut to Mike and Harriet kissing for a moment, and as Hollis leads them back to the carts, we hear light bulbs exploding, and we get this quick insert of the killer smashing light bulbs as he walks down a hallway. And this never comes into play. Like, I thought, like, like they were going to get to a section that was too dark. Dark, yeah. Like they, but, you know, obviously they have, like, head helmets, like, uh, light helmets on their head. But, right. Uh, uh, but I thought, like, maybe the bulbs going off might, like, set off the gas later. Like, they were going to use a, the ga- lights to ignite something. I, no. I, don't, I, I don't understand what the killer was trying to do here. Just be intimidating and destroy the mine. A couple of the kids who escaped the wreck room race into town and tell the chief that Harry Warden is killing people up at the mine. Newbie orders backup immediately and heads straight back to the mine. Hollis and the mine group crash into TJ down here, who fills them in on the murders of Dave and Sylvia up top. They immediately decide to split up so that TJ can do something. I don't know what TJ's part in this mission is, but TJ goes one way and Hollis says he's going to head to the engine room to look for Mike and Harriet. And they leave the jokester Howard with the two girls to protect. There's literally no way you could get me to not stay with Hollis down here, though. (laughs) I want the guy who can put two people in a headlock. Yeah. Specifically, the two people who I think are the killer the most. I I want that guy. Yeah, that that was what TJ was doing. He was going off to be another red herring. (laughs) Yeah. Hollis finds the couple skewered together with an auger, which is the one scene that they never recovered the footage of. They did shoot a full scene of them oh. getting stabbed on this table, but... Um, I was curious why we didn't get a kill for that. Yeah, we just see the aftermath of them stabbed together. And as Hollis backs away from the murder scene, suddenly the killer shines a light in his face and then fires multiple bolts from a nail gun into his head. But Hollis is a tough guy, and he takes two shots in the head, and he still is able to walk away from yeah. this. But, like, is I guess that maybe, like, a, a nail gun like this is something that you would use in a mine to put structure in. Yeah. I don't know. It just it just seemed weird it, to, to have this be one of the tools that, that they killed with. But it seemed like the sadder one because it's like you're destroying the person's brain first. Yeah. Um, but not completely. It's also really inconsistent with the way he kills people. I mean, I mean obviously, we had the hot dog kill... But it seems yeah. like like most of the kills are pickaxe related. That's true. To to, to suddenly go to, I'm going to use a nail gun on this guy. He's a dryer on a lady. And an auger, but we cut the scene. <laughs> but, but no, he he disposed of the body in the yeah, dryer. Yeah, the, okay. the dryer <laughs> didn't <laughs> kill her. I guess. Yeah, he, but he, he strangled her, right? I thought I he think. was hitting her with a pickaxe. Yeah, no, I oh, think did he, he? I think for he some reason her. I thought he came up from behind and strangled her. We get we get the shot of him lifting it up and we cut oh, away. Oh, maybe. Yeah. I think it would have been funny looking back if when they pulled her out of the dryer she just had like a dryer sheet stuck to her shirt. Like, <laughs> like he bothered to put that in there when he put <laughs> oh, the corpse okay. in. He's like, I just want it to be soft. <laughs> the corpse. <laughs> Hollis manages enough strength to wander all the way back to his friends before collapsing with all this blood gushing out of the nail holes in his face and i I think it would have i think it would have been really great to have like hollis take a couple nails to the face but like struggle with the killer and get the mask off but he doesn't have the ability to convey yeah what he saw yeah like to really add to that injury yeah like he comes back and he's like the killer is hollis and then he dies and they're like you're hollis you idiot (laughs) <laughs> Give him a break. he's got a nail in his brain <laughs> suddenly the killer is marching toward them and howard and sarah cannot drag patty away from hollis's body eventually sarah slaps patty really hard to wake her from the shock axel pops out and surprises them and apparently like the killer's not around anymore like the killer was walking directly towards them they didn't move and then axel pops out and they're like oh the killer was just here a second ago and he killed hollis and then they start to hear footsteps so axel grabs a big piece of wood and he waits for the footsteps to come around the corner and he smacks tj with this big log and they're like oh it's just tj never mind uh newbie arrives at the mines but 
when the elevators don't work he's like well fuck it i'm not walking in there so he just stands up at the top and waits for everybody else to get there (laughs) at the bottom of the mine tj finds the elevator controls have been destroyed and that they'll have to climb up a ladder axel heads up first patty's behind him and then sarah and then tj but patty is freaking out on the ladder and sarah has to like drag her up the ladder very slowly as he pulls quickly ahead of them axel accidentally like he hits a trip line on his way up the ladder and then right next to them howard's body falls from the ceiling on a cable and when it runs out of slack it's moving fast enough that it tears his head from his shoulders and it's this happens right next to the girls so they get splashed with howard's blood and then his body continues to fall the rest of the way to the ground of the mine Um, though disconcertingly the head never hits the ground tj suggests they all climb down and look at the body i guess assuming that harry warden is above them and they take the shortcut to the rail cars to escape axel gets separated from the group and they hear a grunt and a splash that seem to imply that he has disappeared completely into the murky mine water they ask tj to save him but tj says there's no use because the water is 60 feet deep and it's bad chemical water you don't want to go in there the last three people head to the rail cars tj points them down a shaft and splits up with them again no idea why Uh, as the girls continue down the shaft the killer pops out and buries a pickaxe in patty's chest before chasing after sarah when sarah stops to catch her breath tj grabs her suddenly from behind not expecting her to freak out about this as tj walks sarah back to the rail cars they're suddenly being pursued by the killer and we finally see tj and the killer in the same shot so we're learning whoever this is it's not tj tj gets the rail cars started and the killer follows them as they climb from car to car away from him they could probably hop off of these carts and walk faster than the carts are going they're not going very fast tj defends himself from several pickaxe swings with a shovel newbie heads a huge team of police down the shaft into the mines tj sarah and the killer work their way into a room labeled danger and continue to fight knocking out support beams as they struggle with each other the killer moves to stab tj and sarah reaches over and yanks off his mask it's axel the other person what? can you believe it i thought it was tj the whole time actually but it's axel well i thought it was the the moment that i thought it was axel was like after they're down in the mine like he was just being really like i think at this point he read the script pages because he just seemed so super suspicious the yeah. entire time they were down in the mine at this this last section i feel like where i knew for sure that it was axel was when you hear the grunt and the splash and it's like if that was a kill we would have seen it happen because it's the uncut version yeah. that we've seen all the kills i mean i so think far. even before that when like he disappears the killer shows up and then he re- the killer disappears and he shows up yeah You're like okay that's yeah. a little sus never see these two in the same room isn't that suspicious but tj asks axel why he would do this and then we get a five second montage of one of the mine supervisors getting killed by warden 20 years ago apparently the guy had a kid hiding under his bed as he was getting murdered and the kid even gets a face full of blood splash as warden is taking out the dad's heart but still okay so wouldn't you be against warden i don't know that was that was going to be my question after we revealed this ending was warden killed your dad what is his motivation like i don't quite understand just to get back at minors or is it like you're making up for your father's mistakes i don't know or he's just crazy he saw that and now he's crazy and he'll just kill people but what has he been doing for the last 20 years yeah well, they haven't been celebrating Valentine's Day for the last 20 years. And, and and I think that I would say from his perspective, since Valentine's Day has been ruined for him forever, he wants it to be ruined for everyone else. Yeah, that's a, that's a good explanation. I like that. TJ shoves Axel away and a bigger beam is knocked loose in this cave, causing a cave in. TJ and Sarah narrowly escape and TJ points the arriving cops in toward where Axel is stuck. TJ tells Newbie that it wasn't Warden and newbie says yeah i know eastfield got back to me tonight and harry warden died five years ago it was axel for some reason it never occurred to the mayor that this could be axel it was on valentine's day that harry warden killed axel's father really it never occurred to you until just now as the rescue team try to unbury axel they find him alive 
and Sarah pushes through the crowd to hold his hand, which suddenly grips her wrist very tightly, and she can't get it away. But under the pile, we see that Axel is 127 hours in his arm off just to freak her out, I guess. Like, he wants to grip her arm as tight as he can and then cut it off so that when she pulls her hand out, it'll still be holding on to her. The rescuers watch through a small window in the collapsed debris as Axel stumbles deeper and deeper into the mine, shouting to the ghost of Harry Warden, Harry! Harry, I'm coming! This whole fucking town is going to die! We're coming back, you bastards! <laughs> Sarah, be my bloody valentine. <laughs> As he vanishes, we hear crazed laughter as the Ballad of Harry Warden begins, which tells the whole story of the film over again as the credits are all. I, uh, I have to admit, I got really excited and happy for this song. Yeah, it's like, a great song. <laughs> what, what is this? Is it got like they've got a folk song for this movie? Yeah, it was it was uh, an afterthought apparently, and Paul Zaza put it in there at the end, and they really liked it, and I think it works really great. Our director here was George Mahalka, who I said before also directed Pick Up Summer, a.k.a. Pinball Summer, which we'll be covering later this year. Even though it was technically his first film, it released second in the U.S. the same year as his second film, this film. The story was by Stephen A. Miller, uh, not the Stephen Miller from the Trump uh, administration, but uh, the Stephen Miller who wrote mostly television. He has mostly TV writing and producing credits on Nightman, Flipper, Magnum, and Airwolf. Uh, the screenwriter here, John Beard, or Baird maybe, uh, he's the uncredited writer of Happy Birthday to Me later this year. And obviously both writers get credits for the 2009 remake. The music here was from Paul Zaza. He's the credited composer on Prom Night and Kidnapping of the President last year. He seems to be the go-to composer for Canadian tax shelter films. Cinematographer Rodney Gibbons, also the DP on Pinball slash Pickup Summer. Paul Kelman played TJ. He's Nino Vespucci in Gas later this year. I'm assuming that's another Canadian one because a lot of the cast show up in Gas. Uh, Laurie, but not Gas. No, not not the Corman one from the 70s. This is the 1981 Gas. Lori Hallier played Sarah. Uh, not many credits I recognized outside of this film. Neil Affleck was Axel. He's a medical student in the mall for scanners earlier this year. I'm assuming that's in the, the first food court scene. I don't remember a lot of mall scenes in scanners. Uh, but most of his credits are in animation as a director on The Simpsons and in the animation departments for The Simpsons, Rugrats, The Critic, and Rocco's Modern Life. He also shows up in Oh Heavenly Dog during the post office scene. I think he's one of the guys that leaves on a lunch break and leaves the old deaf guy there by himself. Alf Humphreys played Howard. Uh, he was Lester in First Blood and William Blake in X2, X-Men United. Cynthia Dale plays Patty. She's Samantha in Heavenly Bodies and Sheila in Moonstruck. She appeared as Olivia Novak on a TV series called Street Legal in the late 80s and early 90s and very recently has reprised the role for a sequel series. Helene Udy, or Helen Udy, I don't know how you pronounce this name. It's Helen with an E at the end. Helene? Helene? Helene. Helene Udy played Sylvia. She also appears in Pinball Summer later this year for the same director. She's also Wyzak's mom in The Dead Zone. Wyzak is the Herbert Lom character, so I'm assuming this is like in a vision that she has or that uh, Christopher Walken has. Rob Stein played John. That's the tall guy. Uh, he also appears in Pinball Summer. Carl Moret played Dave. That's the guy who gets hot dog boiled. He's also in Pinball Summer. Gina Dick played Gretchen. She's Linda, the son's girlfriend in Middle Age Crazy last year. Uh, she's also back this year for Happy Birthday to Me and Ticket to Heaven. Peter Cowper played the Miner and Harry Warden. Uh, so he was the person in the costume whenever you see uh. Harry Warden or... Uh, the guy that was eating the arm in the flashback. So for for most of the film, the the killer is not played by Axel. Right, which is was I think part of the strategy of not having the actor know that they're the killer. Okay. Uh, he has another weird credit, Pamela Natwick Man number two from Oh Heavenly Dog last year. I don't know what Pamela Natwick Man number two means. 
Uh, Don Franks played Chief Newbie. He's the voice of Grimaldi in Heavy Metal later this year. He's also a lot of Star Wars voices over the years, including Boba Fett on Star Wars Droids. He was Latchy in Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. He's the voice of Sabretooth on the X-Men animated series. And alongside Frank Welker, he is one of several people to voice Dr. Claw for Inspector Gadget. Hmm. He's also the father of voice actress Cree Summer, who provided the voice oh. of Penny on Inspector Gadget. Uh, she was also the voice of Amunet on the new DuckTales. Is that how you pronounce it? Is it Amunet or Amunet? Is it like a mummy? Um. Well, I, I know who you're talking to, but I, I mean, I most know Cree Summer from as Elmira. You're so cuddly, wuddly. I'm going to hug you and squeeze you and swing you and spin your tail. Yes, she's Elmira Duff on Tiny Toon Adventures. She's Nebula on the Guardians of the Galaxy series. She was Foxy Love on Drawn Together. And she was Susie Carmichael on Rugrats. But she's great. Patricia Hamilton was Mabel. She plays Rachel Lind in multiple shows about Green Gables. Larry Reynolds played Mayor Hanniger. He was Secdef Morrison in Day of Resurrection, a.k.a. Virus, which I'll be covering later this year as a Patreon exclusive on its 41st anniversary. And Jack Vanavera played Happy, or Hap, and he's also a member of the search party in Black Christmas. Those are all the credits I had for this one. I think this is the best slasher that we've done. Um, I think that i really like the makeup effects for the kills Mm -hmm. i think that they go a little bit further than the kills even in friday the 13th which i would say is the second best yeah um i think the production value of the mine is excellent Mm -hmm. i think that the characters are believably employees of this mine like everything hollis does looks like he's here every day five days a week um i totally believe that they work here that they understand how all this works i think that they they got a lot of research done on how mining communities work and function. Um, and I think the story's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's a serviceable slasher story. I agree with you on everything. I think that the things that could have made it a little bit better were hitting the red herrings a little harder. Sure. And uh, maybe fleshing out axel's motivation a little bit more yeah that the montage does go by very quickly yeah i was just like (laughs) i think you heard me yell from the other one like they wrapped that one up pretty fast yeah really like they're like oh it's axel and by the way oh flashback immediately he's a kid he sees the kill and that's it that's all we. yeah and (laughs) ordinarily like i would let it go by that quickly if we saw that kid get splashed with blood at the beginning and the point was like he was that kid and it was like oh okay but yeah. when you're introducing the the new story element that there was a kid that witnessed that murder yeah. and that this is the adult version of that yeah. kid then it's not something we could have guessed right. from the past but also additionally i don't think that kid witnesses murder of i guess it was his father i don't know yeah uh, it was his father it was his father it, yeah i don't know that you i don't know that that totally explains it no i don't think so either so- and, or or especially that he would be on harry's side that he would be like, Harry, we're on the same team. You killed my dad. So I'm going to kill people. Yeah. Right. Or like, I'm crazy, but I'm going to show no signs of being crazy until somebody has a party. Yeah. What? <laughs> That's weird. So you guys never party? Or you're just really against parties on Valentine's Day? I don't know. I think that it's is just... the point. Uh, part of it is that they can party literally any night they want, but if they party on the actual 14th, that's when it backfires. But he's killing people on so, the 12th and the 13th. Yeah. I don't know. So so no one has had a private Valentine's Day party in that town. No, they don't even they don't even have a party in general um that weekend because if they even hint that they're going to have a party, he's going to start killing people that are vaguely related to the party. So th- that brings me to my questions about the initial killings and why he's targeting these specific people. Um like, like you're talking so, about the supervisors or the girl who gets killed just for having a heart tattoo because hearts he, set him off. <laughs> yeah. So, so I understand he needs to set a precedent for, you know, the party is currently on. I'm going to murder someone and tell them to c- cancel it. If they don't cancel it, I'm going to continue to murder people until they do. Yeah. That's, that's the setup, but how he chooses his targets, like girl, number one uh 
who who doesn't seem to be missing or doesn't no one seems right. to, to talk about being missing uh you know is she just like a girl he picked up i we we don't know anything about this person she is dead yeah uh so you know moving on then why does he target mabel next well because she's enabling the party the most she's the one organizing the whole thing i I guess that makes sense uh and so i i would agree to that but then (laughs) but there's a big roadblock when it when it comes to hap because it makes no sense to kill him when he's the he's the person the most that's the most actively discouraging a party on valentine's day besides you yeah and the other problem is that he's not really these these riddles aren't communicating to the people having the party they're communicating to a guy who's not telling anyone what they say so like the killer is leaving messages for just the chief and the chief isn't sharing any of them and the kid knows that the that the other children aren't getting this message and so so axel needed to be the son of somebody else yeah he needed to be either the son of the mayor or the son of the chief or the son of warden And, and yeah this needed to be something personal um, and it's not that to say that you're, you're seeing your father killed isn't personal, but taking up that mantle of cursing Valentine's day because of it. Yeah. Um, and, and having nothing else leading up to it. Like, like he, he, he never killed anybody else as far as we know. Uh, yeah. On the way uh, to this. Yeah. Yeah. It seems yeah, like no one died know. between those two supervisors and the woman with a heart tattoo. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the, I guess just the concept of this party happening at all set him off. Um, I feel like it, maybe if it more coincided with TJ's arrival. Yeah. With, with his return and, and the jealousy of Sarah being drawn back to him. Uh, th- th- there's so many ways it could have gone and it didn't go any way yeah it, it went no way and that's frustrating to me what if um would this have saved the movie for you if at the as the credits are drawing to a close you're still hearing this folk song about the ballad of harry warden and then at the end of the song uh we fade into picture and we see that tj has been singing this song in a recording booth and when he finishes the producer behind the glass goes that was fucking terrible you should go back to valentine bluff and it turns out that that's (laughs) that's where he was (laughs) that was that was why he got sent back to town that would have he he wanted to 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 go out on his own and start his country music yeah (laughs) career or he he became a jazz singer on the other side of town He's like, you're but ruining he my song. About murderers. It's supposed to be slower. I'll sing it like this. But I really like this movie. I th- I thought it was pretty great. Um, so big thumbs up from me. I'll give it a, a medium thumbs up. Medium thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna break those down into different different. <laughs> well, you levels. said big thumbs up. I'm just saying it's a yeah. thumbs up, but like, it had some flaws. Yeah. Richard. Uh, it's a down. It's a down. Okay. I I will I will never watch this movie again i think the reason this movie isn't better known is because the cover box sucks like the cover box is stupid it's a person wearing a mining costume with the eyes taken out of it so that you can see their eyeballs and then there's like a picture in the light bulb at the top it's like just show a valentine's box with a bloody heart in it that's all you had to do (laughs) convey the movie and make people understand that it's a valentine's themed horror film the the person in a weird mask doesn't tell me that this is a valentine's themed horror film i don't care if it says my bloody valentine at the top i'm confused why there's a person in mining gear on the cover box i think that was the that's the biggest failure i can communicate for this film i think it would have made more money if if it were just a a bleeding valentine box all right and where's this going on your letterbox uh surprisingly high <laughs> <laughs> um uh i blame early releases yeah uh as as much as i I I feel bad because I did enjoy the sand pit stuff in Blood Beach. I am putting this above Blood Beach uh, in the number eight position, just below Cabo Blanco. Eight out of 12 is surprisingly high. <laughs> well, it could have been at the bottom. Sure. Could it have, what? though? Really? 
there, there's all there. Scream and Home Sweet Home. Couple and Earth, unfinished Earth, movies. Yeah, Earthbound's down there. The bottom, the bottom is real low. <laughs> yeah, the bottom are literally movies people weren't supposed to see. It's it's like it's like if it was a graph, it would have one of those little jagged lines to yeah. indicate that there's a lot of gap in between where this <laughs> next position is. <laughs> that makes sense. All right, Jess, where's this going on your letterbox? Um surprisingly high <laughs> all right <laughs> i have it at number three yeah so i have it after fear no evil but above uh the incredible shrinking woman all right uh i also have it surprisingly high uh it's just above scanners what and it's not below anything what really yeah really better I've... than scanners what is wrong with you yeah like I enjoyed this one, but what? Yeah, I think so. Scanners is so great. I don't know. It, it was honestly a, a tough call. It's either one or two, but um, I don't know. I feel like I like the performances better in My Bloody Valentine. Um, I, I really like the, the gore effects. I mean, the gore effects are great in both, so that's not a fair. I think uh, you're going to regret this decision when we get more movies that we like because the there's just a, I feel like there's a gap between there that you're getting wrong here. I don't know. No, you do what oh. you gotta do. Well, let, let, me, let me give me a second here. No, I, I say I say play it as it lies, and then just from there it's gonna be an interesting. It's gonna be an interesting mix going forward, though. Of what I mean, those movies are always gonna be pretty close to each other because I like them both a lot. Okay, I guess I'm I, I guess I'm surprised because to me. Scanners is so far above. Even though it's only two, currently only two spaces above, to me, Scanners is so much better than this movie that that's surprising me that you have it above there, that you have them in a similar area. I don't know, but Scanners also has, like, slow chunks where this, like, My Bloody Valentine doesn't. It's, like, pretty nonstop. Yeah, but I feel like My Bloody Valentine has a lot of... Like it's it's like a cheesy horror film. Like to me, it's not like it's like it's not like a legit scary movie. Whereas Scanners is like actually got some psychological like like horror to it. All right, you know what? I'm switching it. I, I I'm not trying to convince you to no, switch it. I I think I think it might go below Scanners just barely for me. But I'm just remembering how much I really do love Scanners, especially that that last standoff with and Ironside. The yeah. effects are so good, and the and the music and the sound uh, does so much for the film. I yeah, I really enjoy the, the characters. The You're right. Characters. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, but it's still it's number two for me. But uh, yeah, Scanners does edge it out just barely. I think that's everything for My Bloody Valentine. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord now. You can find the button at the top of our .com and join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future. Also, search for Vintage Video Podcast on YouTube and subscribe to our new channel there. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Sphinx, which IMDb describes like so. Egyptologist Erica Barron finds more than she bargained for during her long-planned trip to the land of the pharaohs. Murder, theft, betrayal, love, and a mummy's curse. Gotta love a mummy's curse. We leave you now with the trailer for Sphinx. For thousands of years, a part of the world has been a world of its own. Where sands conceal the present, and pyramids point to the past. To this burial place of kings, to this hiding place of treasures, she has come. I'm an Efter, chief physician and architect for the living God, king of the two lands, to reverently atone for the disturbance of the eternal rest of the king, Tutankhamun. In this land of mystery, she asks too many questions. What about the papyrus? I think you had better leave. In this land of danger, she comes too close to the truth. <laughs> Whoever killed him is going to hang for it. In this land of betrayal, she dares to fall in love. Oh, I didn't want this to happen. In this land of ancient secrets, she pursues the greatest riddle of all. This is my find. 
A chance like this is not going to come again in a million years. Space, based on the international best-selling novel. I had to be certain that you were who you said you were. What do you want? What do you know about the black market? <laughs> Why don't you ask the girl? You just don't think she knows something? <laughs> I wanted you to leave. Now it's too late. Leslie Ann Down, Frank Langella, Maurice Romay, John Gilgood, Sphinx. Many have died to keep the secret. Many will die to learn it.